Hi there, thanks for joining us on this, the latest edition of Space Nuts. I'm Andrew Dunkley, your host. Great to have your company. Coming up today, we are going to look at volcanoes, not on Earth, uh, not on Mars, but on Venus, and it's starting to look like some of them might actually be active. Wow, that's quite a thing. And uh, we've spoken before about uh, the Ryugu asteroid. Samples of that were brought back to Earth, and they've done some more analysis on them, and some more revelations have been made. We'll also be answering questions about visible light energy, how slow can light go, and matter and antimatter questions as well. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, the guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. At the night report, it feels good. And joining me to discuss all of that at length, and we'll be finished in a couple of minutes, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. <laughs> what a great show that was. Yes, yes. Catch you next week. <laughs> How are you, Fred? Uh, very well, thank you. Uh, I'm coming to you from a hotel room in Canberra, which is where the lighting, if uh, people are watching on YouTube, the lighting is less than optimal. Mm. Uh, but, um, you can probably see that it's me. Um, and the re so my the reason why I'm sort of sitting here without headphones or anything like that is because my plans have changed. I was supposed to be going back home to Sydney yesterday after meetings uh, at the Department of Industry and at Questacon, the mm. uh, Science Centre here in Canberra. But um, I, I I got my days wrong. I just had a lightning flash there, so I'm Ooh. Gonna take myself off the mains just in case there's a power surge through the through the mains. Uh, it shouldn't have any effect because I've got a full charge on on the battery on the laptop. Um, the uh, hot dog on the phone as well. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Um, so, so I, 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 in fact, I got my days wrong. So all this is my fault. Uh, but today, um, at the national press club, which is, uh, one of the main, um, ways that what you might call government, uh, in fact, it is often government, uh, politicians use this a lot. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes, uh, other people who are in public life for one reason or another, it's, it's the, uh, you know, the, the voice. Uh, that allows people to communicate their ideas and policies sometimes. So the mm. National Press Club is a big gig. The National Press Club lunch is a very big deal. And today uh, at the National Press Club, we have the NASA administrator, Bill Ooh. Nelson. Wow. And his deputy, Pam Melroy, who we know um, because she wrote a lovely endorsement of Cosmic Chronicles when it came to know and the gig with it in the past and things like that. So um, it seemed like a good idea to try and get myself into that. Yes. Uh, my colleagues in the Department of Industry have, have the Space Agency, out. I think it's the Space Agency that I'm going with, have found me a ticket, so I shall be there at um, 11.30 this morning. Assuming we haven't all get washed away by the rain that I think is now falling out. Yeah, yeah. But that's exciting. What a great event. Uh, of yeah. course, the, the National Press Club uh, is always broadcast on the ABC, so uh, people can tune in and watch that at lunchtime, um, our time. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's 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 quite often the the um, the way that politicians get grilled, yeah. and it's um yeah it gets more attention leading up to a federal election. But uh, it, it, yeah, that people it operates very regularly, and uh, always uh, a source of um, news stories and information. So yeah, that'll be great. That'll be really exciting. Mm, maybe I'll sure was there. We'll report on it next week or whenever. Um, Perhaps the, um, the it is interesting, as you said. They they uh, you know politicians use it for election policies. We are what three days out or two days out now from a state election. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I guess and, that doesn't count in the national press club because uh, uh, the Australian capital territory, where the press club is, is not New South Wales. No, it's not. Um, and, and to be honest, I honest, I, I really don't know which way the election is going to go this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. Could um, yeah, it could go either way. It, I guess it just depends on the mood of the electorate in the wake of COVID nineteen. But uh, the 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 sitting party is um, is coming out of some uh, turmoil with a with a few uh, 
changes in the ranks um, forced upon them by um, uh, unfortunate situations. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I'm, I'm just not sure. Okay, let's get down to business, Fred. And uh, volcanoes on Venus, we know they exist. We know they're on Earth. We know they're on many planets, Titan, etc., uh, and moons. But uh, these ones are starting to look like they're just not sitting there dormant, twiddling their thumbs. They're, they're signs of activity. That's pretty interesting. It is. Yeah, I think this is a really um, exciting result. Uh, so at, the, at present, we know for certain that we know for certain of two volcanically active bodies in the solar system. One is our own planet, and the other, of course, is Io, uh, Jupiter's little moon that's quite next, quite near to Jupiter. Uh, actually, it's quite a big moon when you compare some of the other moons of Jupiter, which are just rocks. Uh, but Io's um, stretched and squeezed by the uh, gravitational attraction of Jupiter, the tidal forces, and so it's very volcanically active. In fact, it's considered to be the most volcanic uh -huh. active. Did I say Titan? I thought Titan was, but it's it's EO. Yes, that's right. Titan, actually, you're not you're not uh, wrong because there's evidence of cryovolcanoes on Titan. These yeah, there was something, uh, yeah, freezing cold slush. That's right. So you're not you're not off the mark. Uh, but EO is certainly the, the most uh, volcanic one. Um, but Venus, uh, kind of since the Magellan spacecraft, which was in orbit around Venus thirty years ago. Uh, since it, it, because Venus has got this huge atmosphere, thick, thick clouds, not a huge atmosphere, it's just a normal atmosphere, but it's very thick, uh, uh, high density, a hundred times the pressure of our atmosphere here on Earth, uh, and uh, um, essentially opaque, um, uh, so that you can't see the surface directly. Uh, it, it, Magellan, to, com to combat that, was equipped with the very accurate radar system. So, you know, um, uh, this sort of radar that allows you to map the terrain beneath and give you topographical information like hill heights, mountain heights, yes. and all the rest of it. And so that's why we've got really good maps of uh, Venus's surface. And um, my recollection from the statistics is that what we know about that uh, is that Venus has the most volcanoes of any object in the solar system. Uh, wow. But we believe, we've believed until now um, it was volcanically dormant, that these come from an ancient period uh, when Venus was much more geologically active than it is today. Mm. Until now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's happened, Andrew, is um, it's actually a scientist at the University of Alaska, Robert Herrick, who's a planetary scientist, and he's published a paper uh, which uh, comes out uh, I asked him out this week uh, at the 54th Lunar Planetary Science Conference in Houston. Uh, and what he's detected is a particular volcanic vent that's changed its shape. Uh, and the reason why he can do that is that um, when Magellan was flying over Venus and doing its mapping, mm. um, it, it actually did, certainly for some parts of Venus, it did three cycles. Uh, between 1991 and 1992, um, and something like 42 percent of the planet was imaged or radar imaged uh, more than more than uh, more than once, uh, at least twice. So um, that's what allowed this uh, scientist to trail, not to trawl through the the data and look at differences between the two sets of images. I think they're about eight months apart, if I remember rightly, from the, the paper. Um, so, uh, and uh, yes, uh, Professor Herrick has realized that one particular crater, and it's actually one of the biggest, it's a mountain called Mart, M-A-A-T, Mons. Mons is just Mount, uh, uh, and it's very close to Venus's equator. Uh, and um, the, the 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 essence of his argument was um, that if you were going to look for activity today, you would look at the biggest volcanoes, and you might also think about looking on the equator, which is um, you know where you experience well 
tidal forces and centrifugal forces and all of that stuff. Not that yep. that probably makes much difference, but you're looking. Um, and he's got this lovely comment uh, about his search through the data. It was a search for a needle in a haystack without any guarantee that there was a needle there. <laughs> um, he's, he's, and he said, if, you, if you're going to bet on where the most likely place for an eruption to occur on Venus, this would it. This would be it. It's the, mm. the tallest volcano on the planet. And sure enough, um, he's re realized uh, that there's a, an area which is the sort of summit, the crater summit of of Mont uh, of Mar Mart Mons, yeah. uh, which is about um, two, nearly two and a half uh, kilometers wide, um, and, and uh, about eight kilometers in height. That mountain, isn't it? That, yes, in incredible. That's right, big, big mountain. But but it, it, that at that area had doubled in size over the eight months. Wow. Um, what he's suggesting is maybe there's. Um, well, let me let me quote uh, Professor Herrick. The most reasonable interpretation of that data is that there has been an eruption that has come up and changed the shape of the vent and filled it so it looks like a lava lake and has filled up to near the rim. Um, and, and and in fact, he's uh, he's goes on to say on Earth, there's never been, as far as I know, a volcanic event that is changed by multiple kilometers without an eruption occurring somewhere nearby. Yeah, so I think that's probably fair enough. Um, and, and what he suggests, oh, that, that there, is a, that there is another aspect to this because apparently there's a, an, an area in the radar images that's near the vent, in fact, downstream from the vent, that's brighter in the later images. And that suggests a rougher surface. Bright usually means rough when you're looking at radar images. And uh, Professor Herrick says, this suggests that perhaps a new flow of lava has formed, but he but he said there was a caveat with that uh, because they can't um, actually rule out the possibility that that particular observation was an artifact of the viewing angle uh, oh. from between the two. But that's been ruled out for the main observation. Okay, uh, yeah, it's, so it's very, quite extraordinary. Uh, uh, are we, uh, you know, if if this is the case, and it seems pretty obvious that it is, uh, with volcanic activity on Venus, what's causing the volcanic activity? Is it tectonics? Because they don't have tectonics on Mars. Uh, we do on Earth, and that's got a lot to do with what is happening beneath the surface and uh, yes. moving all that magma around. What's the story on Venus? So I think you and I, um, probably a year or so ago, Andrew, had a story that was again from Magellan data. Uh, and it was looking at sort of linear features on the surface of Mars. Um, and this is different. It wasn't recording any changes or anything, but it was suggesting that the particular layout of these features could be due to low level tectonic activity. Then mm. we're getting perhaps some sort of division into crustal plates. Now, as we, as as we get to know, did I say Mars there when I'm at Venus? Come on, anyway, <laughs> not talking about Mars. I'm talking about Venus. Um, so the, um, the, the the these crustal plates may actually be moving, uh, and I guess all of this is going to be food for thought. Yeah, for the very task mission which uh, you and I have talked about, um, which is a NASA mission. Uh, there's also a, 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 a an Easter mission called Envision. Uh, which I think uh, both of those will have much more detailed radar capabilities. Uh, they apparently they're not scheduled for launch until the, the early 2030s. Um, Was that thunder? I just yes, heard? yes. Wow, it's quite loud outside. Uh, so we've got the whole thing today. We yeah, can, and <laughs> the wrong place, the wrong time, and a thunderstorm. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, that, that Veritas mission, unfortunately, has been pushed back and probably won't be launched until oh, 2028 at the earliest, but probably 2031 is yeah. the, the year they're looking at now. So we're going to have to be very patient to get the backup data. But, gee, and, and you know, the other pity about Venus is we can't see a damn thing. We just, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could actually do what we do on um, on Mars and have well, an orbit, orbital spacecraft that can take high-resolution photos, but all we get, 
all we get is cloud. <laughs> yes. Well, that's right. The clouds themselves are really interesting, though. <laughs> You know, with their sulfuric acid uh, aerosols and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, but you're right. Um, I should I just put in a, a plug for um, a, a former colleague of mine who's sadly no longer with us, David Allen. He used the Anglo-Australian Telescope at Coonabarabran in New South Wales, the one I used to be a strong in charge of, uh, back in probably the early 1990s, maybe 1980s, late 1980s, but he actually used an infrared camera on that telescope to demonstrate that he could detect the surface of Venus in infrared wow. radiation. Uh, but I think it was more of a glimpse than anything, just a, a, a region of the clouds where the, where the transparency was a bit higher than it, it is elsewhere. Mm. But it got an infrared signal that could only have been the surface because of its temperature. Okay. All right. Well, we'll watch with interest and uh, we will hopefully learn more about the volcanic activity of Venus in the not too distant future. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Okay. We take the whole ball to the fan. Being with a girl. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's move on from uh, volcanoes on Venus to asteroids that have uh, very interesting things that we're learning. Uh, including the uh, the one that uh, had a, a return sample brought back to Earth that's been analysed, and that is Ryugu. And I, I did see a lot of these news stories popping up this morning because they've made another pretty a, a startling discovery in this regard too. Uh, that's right. I've got the, the Nature Communications paper in front of me now. It's titled Uracil in the Carbonaceous Asteroid 162173 Ryugu. And, it, and there's a very long list of authors, <laughs> Yeah, most, most of whom, as you might expect, uh, are Japanese names, They because it's uh, not all of them, but most of them, uh, because it's a Japanese spacecraft that brought back that sample. Mm. Um, and um, um, maybe I might, um, I might just uh, read the abstract of that paper, at least some of it, because it's not gobbledygook like so many of these asteroid, uh, so, sorry, so many of these research paper abstracts are. Um, and it starts off the pristine sample from near-Earth carbonaceous asteroid 162173 Ryugu, collected by the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft, enabled us to analyze the pristine extraterrestrial material without uncontrolled exposure to the Earth's atmosphere and biosphere. And of course, that's what you get with, with meteorites, Andrew. They lie on the surface of the Earth, and so yeah. you can't rule out contamination. Uh, and so the abstract goes on to say the initial analysis team for the soluble organic matter reported the detector detection of a wide variety of organic molecules, including racemic amino acids in the Ryugu sample. Here we report the detection of uracil, one of the four nucleobases in ribonucleic acid, that's RNA, yeah. uh, in aqueous extract from Ryugu samples. Um, and it, it goes on to, to, to look at the details. Um, and the, the su suggestion is that what we've got here is, is a component of RNA. Now, RNA is not DNA, uh, but it's what, you know, it's one of the molecules that the sort of enabling molecules that's very important in living organisms, uh, on earth. So, uh, this amino acid is like a bit of a tracer. Once again, that uh, these complex organic molecules were able to form <clears throat> probably in the depths of space in cold molecular clouds and then condense onto uh, primitive asteroids like Ry Ryugu. That's one reason why this asteroid was chosen for, a, for the mission, because it's a carbonaceous asteroid. It's probably one of the, one of the earliest types of object formed in the, as the solar system was forming. And mm. it's got this uracil in. Now, I'm not an organic chemist uh, by any means. <laughs> But I think it's a pretty exciting result. Uh, just a caveat again there. Uh, I believe that uracil has also been detected in meteorite samples. Yeah. But as, as I was just saying, uh, because meteorites land on the ground uh, and uh, sometimes lie there for quite a long time. You can and it's in, uh, I believe it's also found in the uracil bunny. <laughs> <laughs> the one that keeps on going. <laughs> Sorry, that was just so awful. I had to do it. 
the dad jokes are thick and fast. Yeah, yeah. We did a whole bunch of them on the radio the other day, and I haven't, I haven't stopped hearing about it because it was the answer to my quiz question: the origin of dad jokes. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, they they date way back to 1987. It was the original dad. <laughs> that's the I think. well, that's the thing. Yeah, uh, they were defined in 1987. I'm sure they existed a lot yeah. further back than yeah. that. Mm. Yeah. But what a great what a great, coming back from uh, Duracell to Duracell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a great result. Very very interesting. There's a. Uh, um, uh, our listeners and watchers want to catch up a little bit on it. There is a uh, really interesting article on the conversation uh, by Trevor Ireland, who is professor of, uh, at the School of Earth and Environmental Scientists in the University of Queensland. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, his article really captures the excitement of that and gives all the details for anybody who's interested in organic chemistry. And it also has a link to the original paper as well. I suppose the, the question that comes up with a discovery like this in the previous discoveries as a consequence of an analysis of the samples from Ryugu is what does it mean for planets like ours that have advanced life? Is this like, um, you know, would you call Ryugu like a seed pod or something like that? Uh, and asteroids like it have perhaps been responsible for creating the opportunity for life to exist on this and perhaps other planets? Yep. I think that's a really good analogy, uh, quite extraordinary. Um, th actually, there's a little postscript here, which I meant to mention, and, uh, mm -hmm. and it's um, uh, Trevor Ireland's paper that's uh, reminded me of it. Um, so amino acids, uh, which if I understand things correctly, um, go towards uh, proteins. Uh, those amino acids uh, that are produced by life processes uh, on Earth, there's a thing, let, let me just step back, there's a thing called chirality. Do you know about this? We, I can't remember whether I've ever talked about this before, but I, I've always so much you know, Knowing my memory, we probably have, but it's not coming through. <laughs> it's, um, it's about the way mole complex molecules are put together, and many of these, certainly amino acids, um, can be put together in either a left-handed way or a right-handed way. It's just the you know the the, the structure of the of the molecules. Um, okay. If you think, think about your left hand and your right hand, they're they're symmetric, and some of these molecules. Are. So you can put them together either one way, and it's called left-handed or right-handed. That is the chirality. Chirality is whether it's left or right-handed, and all uh, amino acids produced by life processes on Earth are left-handed. Wow. However. Uh, the ones that come from the Ryugu samples uh, are equally both right-handed and left-handed molecules. Grief. And so what uh, um, Trevor Island draws from this, and I think it's probably you know the, the, the view of uh, experts in this field, it indicates the molecules found on Ryugu are not signs of life because oh. they've, they've got this equal distribution of left and right-handed. If you found they were all left-handed, uh, like life is on Earth, um, yeah, maybe you'd, you'd start thinking a bit more deeply about it. Yeah, I, I so you're telling me I was wrong, actually. But uh, no, anyway, no, I'm not. No, because, no, the seed pods uh, they're not they're not seed pods of life. They're seed pods of the of the you know the building the building blocks building blocks. Mm. Yeah. So it's a case of uh, hits the Earth, just add water. <laughs> That's right. I've had a few other conflicts. A few other things to just, you know, to chuck into the mix. Um, the, I, I think the creator reminds me of my childhood. We just, I'd, I'd get a jar and I'd just put stuff in it to see what happens. Nearly blew myself up one day because I added honey to powdered chlorine. <laughs> and, and it turned into, a, turned into a blasted bomb. I, I picked it up and the jar was really hot, almost burning hot. And um, oh, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I was an idiot. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess that's that's how these things happen, and that's possibly how life evolved on on this planet. Just some kind of weird mix that was just right. Mm. I mean, people have talked about this in detail, and that's certainly part of the story. But um, another part that I've always found interested is and interesting is you need. So the fatty molecules as well, uh, lipids, because what you 
want is to have these fatty molecules that can provide a kind of envelope, uh, in other words, a cell wall uh, within which these reactions can take place so that you, you actually can find them. They're not just reactions taking place in, a, in an amorphous blob of, of something. You've got them confined within a cell, and that's you know the way people think maybe cells originated. Mm. Speaking of which, I saw an article last week um, that suggested that by 2050, more than 50% of the world's population will be obese. I know that's got nothing to do with Ryugu, but uh, you were talking about fatty molecules and uh, just popped into my head. That, that's quite a staggering statistic when you think about it. It is, yes. Um, and they've released a report on the data and suggested that um, the world needs to do something about it, and that's probably true. But uh, can we expect more revelations from Ryugu going forward? Probably can. Um, I think we should watch this space. There's, uh, I don't think they're going to find DNA in it or anything like that. But it is. Wouldn't that be a shock? Be a shock. Yeah, quite extraordinary. All right, uh, more to come on Ryugu. But uh, as Fred said, if you want to chase that story up, it's on the conversation.com website. Okay, we take the balls to stool and in with a go. Spence nuts. Oh, gosh, this we're travelling along at a rate of knots, Fred, um, but uh, it is question time. We've got uh, uh, three questions to deal with today, two audio questions and a text question. Uh, we will firstly hear from Rennie, who is uh, asking us about uh, visible light energy. Hi, this is Rennie Traub from West Hills, California. Thank you for answering my last question. I have another one that's been bothering me. The question has to do with the visible light coming out of the sun. If at all possible in simple terms, what creates these light particles and how do these particles have enough energy to travel across the universe to an observer's eye? And why can't we mimic this energy to propel our rockets that would carry our robotic space explorers? Wow, that's a that's a lot. That's a big question. Um, uh, so I suppose uh, in a couple of parts, uh, what creates the light particles initially? And, and that's a fantastic question, um, which has a pretty neat answer, uh, Andrew. The sun. Um, well, the sun. Yeah. So deep in the sun's core, and this is way below, you know, the levels that we can see. Um, let's let's look at the. Uh, what we can see of the sun, what we what we see is something called the photosphere, uh, which is essentially the 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 kind of boundary of the sun beyond below which you can't see. Now the sun's yeah. a ball of gas, uh, but the photosphere is uh, that that almost what you might call the light emitting surface. It's it's where the radiation actually escapes from this ball of gas. Mm. But that radiation has had a long and tumultuous journey. Because deep in the sun's interior, that's the core. It's where the nuclear reactions are taking place that power the sun. And as you know, the main reaction is turning uh, hydrogen into helium. And that process actually uh, gives you a, a, a slight mass loss. If I remember rightly, the sun loses, is it 6 million tons per second of mass? It's something like that. It's been it sounds million. like a lot. It is, yes. And when you, you, know, when you multiply that by... Uh, C squared, the speed of light squared to get the energy loss, you can see that there's a huge amount of energy being created there. Yeah. And that energy is in the form of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. In fact, it's gamma rays. It's high energy gamma rays that are created in the interior of the sun. Um, but the density there is so high that a, a gamma ray photon emitted by a nuclear reaction doesn't get very far before it hits something else. And then it's scattered off and that process repeatedly happens throughout the sun's interior. Uh, the photons are getting scattered <clears throat> from other other um, nuclei, atomic nuclei, and eventually from other atoms. Uh, and that scattering reduces their energy. So as the sun, uh, as the radiation gets finally to the surface of the sun, it's coming out as visible light, mm. and then there are gamma rays as well, but they're at a much lower level, predominant radiation is visible light. But this is the, the great thing, Andrew, um, 
that process, that scattering process, takes in the region of 200,000 years. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. It is. Um, I, in fact, I think, I think I wrote about it in one of the books. I can't remember which one. Uh, and I, I, I checked the best value. It's, it's really a guess. People, people are, it's an estimate, not so much a guess, a guesstimate perhaps is the right word. Mm. And somewhere between 170,000 and a million years is what, what the figure is. So it's so during. Does that actually mean the light hitting us now was created before the dawn of humanity? Uh, well, it, mean, it means it's our distant ancestors' time. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Like, you know, um, it's not, not I, I think we, we, we place kind of recognizable humans at about two million years ago. So it's right. like, oh, it's pretty uh, close. It may, it may even be a lot more than that. So it is pretty close. Um, what, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that it takes maybe two or 300,000 years for light to get from the center of the sun to the edge and then eight minutes to get <laughs> 150 million kilometers to us. Um, so, yes, it's a fascinating thing. So that's, uh, that's how the radiation kind of is created, René. Um, you, you wanted you, to know how does it travel so far yes, once it gets out? If that's because, hello, oh, excuse me, light is... <clears throat> Excuse me. Electromagnetic radiation doesn't have a, a limit to how far it will go. Um, what limits it in in reality is, you know, the intensity eventually would get so low that it's uh, undetectable by any means that we might have access to. But it goes on forever. Unlike um, the two fundamental forces which relate to atoms, which only have a very short range, mm. uh, the stronger weak nu nuclear forces. The two other fundamental forces gravitation and, and electromagnetic radiation effectively go on infinitely, um, uh, but at very low levels, because it's a, an inverse square rule. It means that uh, a, 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 when it goes twice as far, its intensity drops by four four times. Uh, so, I have I have another theory, Rennie. If you're in jail for 200,000 years, you want to get as far away as you can when you get out. <laughs> yeah. That's a good analogy. And how do we harness this power to, uh, you know, reach speeds that will get us uh, traveling into the cosmos? I, I think um, was his last question. It was it was how do we how do we create uh, artificial sunlight? I guess to mm. propel solar sails along, and that's exactly what the Breakthrough Starshot project is all about. Uh, it's using, uh, it's trying to demonstrate the idea of using lasers to. Uh, to, to propel a solar sail vehicle to Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away. Yeah. And so people are thinking about it, Rene. It, it's, a, it's a great question. Fabulous. Thanks, Rene. Hope we answered it adequately. Let's move on to our next question from Fenton. Yeah, hello, Shadow This is Fenton calling you from Minnesota, the U.S. I would mention off the top, that I really like your show because you can hear people questions from many different countries. I think that's really great. Anyway, here's my question. It's antimatter time. So there is more matter, antimatter in the universe. How much more? What are the relative amounts of antimatter and matter? So question number two, is it conceivable that um, there's another solar system someplace that's made of antimatter. Uh, question number three, uh, what would happen if we tried to shake hands with an antimatter person? <laughs> okay, thanks. I enjoy it. Hope you like the question. Bye-bye. Love the question. Thank you, Fenton. Uh, so, yeah, there's more matter than antimatter, he suggests. Uh, how much more? Uh, I'm... I'm Sorry, I can't remember the fractions, but overwhelmingly, um, matter is the the dominant by very large quantities. The dominant type of matter in our part of the universe, not just the solar system, but probably our whole galaxy and maybe even our uh, our local group and the the local cluster of galaxies. It's all matter. Um, and by the way, just the reminder that antimatter is just like matter, but it, the the subatomic particles have the opposite charge. They're left-handed. <laughs> They're left-handed. Except it's a bit different. So let's just 
forget that. <laughs> You're all right. That's molecule. Um, so they've got the opposite electrical charge. So electrons have an antimatter equivalent called positrons, uh, which have a positive electronic charge, a pro- mm. positive charge to them. So um, uh, we we do know that antimatter is created in some nuclear reactions. And I read a story quite recently from one of the accelerators, and I don't, can't remember whether it was the Large Hadron Collider or one of the um, accelerators in the United States, but they have an antimatter factory uh, which produces tiny, tiny amounts of this stuff because it, it, you know you can't let it touch matter because the two annihilate with the production of the high-energy photon. Um, once again, gamma rays. And so that's actually one of the ways that people look for antimatter deep in the universe, because if you have matter and antimatter annihilating, you get a gamma ray with a particular spectrum signal. It's got a particular energy. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, you know, whether there's evidence of cause of antimatter in some galaxies, for example, uh, but that's the way that, that scientists look for it. Uh, so, uh, Fenton's question about whether there could be another solar system made, yeah, of, antimatter. made of antimatter is not is not it's not ruled out. Um, we simply don't know. There may be other parts of the universe which have a bigger concentration of matter of antimatter than matter. Um, it, it may well be unlikely because at one point the universe was all in one place. And I should just add that it, it's a puzzle uh, actually as to why. This is something that troubles cosmologists. Why the universe, when it was created, why there was an imbalance, a slight imbalance between matter and antimatter? Uh, because if there'd been a perfect match of matter and antimatter in the early universe, then the universe would have been completely made of energy. Uh, there wouldn't have been any matter at all because it would all have annihilated if there was a perfect match of one to the other. So in that, is, in that case, Fred, it wouldn't matter. Oh. <laughs> Ta-da! Uh, are they getting better as you go along? Yeah, I'm small. I'm smouldering today. Certainly not on fire. <laughs> Just don't annihilate yourself. With <laughs> no, someone else will do that. Yes. <laughs> um, mm. yeah, they might. Anyway, uh, so uh, yes, so there the, the could be uh, other regions of the universe that are made of antimatter, but we don't know. Uh, and yeah, if you shake hands with somebody, you're in big trouble. Uh, no. So, if an antimatter person walks in your doorway there behind you, Andrew, keep well away. Keep well out of the... Yeah, do not touch. Although, they'd probably get destroyed by anything they touched, wouldn't they? Well, the atmosphere would destroy them all. Yeah, day. yeah. So, it's we're pretty safe. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Fenton. And I uh, hope you're well in Minnesota. And I hope it's getting warmer. Uh, one final question. This one comes from Emma in Brisbane. Uh, Hi, Fred and Andrew. I love your podcast. I have a question regarding the speed of light. Never had one of those before. Uh, What is the slowest light can travel through a medium? Could I go faster than light in that medium? Uh, How would I achieve this? Run fast. Uh, Would I then be able to say that I've gone faster than light? I wouldn't be able to say that I've gone faster than the maximum speed of light, but I would have gone faster than light at a speed. I need help finishing my bucket list. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Um, what is the slowest, the slowest that light can travel? And I did mention a week or two ago that there have been some experiments done and they've actually managed to stop light dead in its tracks. So everybody has now achieved faster than light speed. Basically true. Exactly right. Um, so just to clarify that it's the speed of light in a vacuum that's the ultimate speed limit, mm. 300,000 kilometers per second. So that's the one you can never go fast on. But as soon as light passes through glass or water or any transparent medium, it slows down by a significant amount. And that's why we have the phenomenon of refraction, because the light is is changing its speed. Mm. Um, so, um, but yes, you're absolutely right, Andrew. Modern physics, uh, some modern physics experiments uh, with laser light uh, and really quite interesting media that they're passing the light through. I think what you're doing is trying to trap photons among subatomic particles. I, I'm not directly across that, but I, I do 
recall that there is, you know, that the record has been dropping over the last few years that light has been traveling at a few centimeters per second rather than a few, few hundred thousand kilometers per second. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and eventually um, somebody's managed to create a stationary photon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yes, everybody has traveled faster than the speed of light. So you can cross that off your bu- bucket list, Emma. Yeah, it's well done. <laughs> yeah, but been just a good while up in Brisbane. Yes, indeed. Yeah, lovely city. I love Brisbane. Hate their football team, but love Brisbane. Um, actually, they've got two football teams now because we've got a new one started this year. It's um, they've won they've won their first three games, as it turns out, the Dolphins. So uh, they're off to a flying start. Uh, thank you, uh, Rennie. Uh, thank you, Fenton. Thank you, Emma. And uh, that brings us to the end of a show. Don't, uh, our show this week. And don't forget to visit our website because that's where you can send us questions. Click on the AMA tab uh, where you can send us text or audio questions or just click on the send us your voice message on the right-hand side. And don't forget to tell us who you are, where you're from, and how many dogs you own and what they eat for breakfast. We want to know everything. Uh, you can also visit the Astronomy Daily newsletter on our website. The uh, Space Nuts shop is there. And uh, if you want to learn about how to support Space Nuts, whether it's uh, to buy us a cup of coffee or to uh, go the whole hog and become a patron, uh, you can do that too. And uh, thank you uh, to our patrons who um, are, are such wonderful supporters of the podcast. We uh, so much appreciate it. Fred, uh, thank you so much. We're going to wrap it up and we'll catch you on the very next episode. Sounds great, Andrew. All the best and thanks again for a great show. Stay dry and avoid politicians in Canberra. At all costs. No, they're good people. Uh, Thanks, Fred. Uh, Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And thanks to Hugh in the studio who got us uh, out live at the very last second this morning. I didn't give him more than a moment's notice. So well done, Hugh, for a change. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. We look forward to your company again on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. From Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Letting the boy be Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.